the, the... Right, guys, if, if you've been given like a prompt like in the party chat to include your voice, can you just make sure that you do it, please? <laughs> Coming through. That music is definitely coming through. I'm liking it, though, Matt. Yes, cool. Matt, you're coming through. Okay, Legion Commando, just say a few words, please, just so we can make Yo, sure. Yo, Tommy Abraham just scored for Chelsea. Come on, one nil. Okay, so you good. How about you, Leach? Hey, what's up, guys? Hey, what's up, guys? <laughs> no, I see. I see. I see. I see. I Thank you so much for your patience, especially with that music by DJ Zerma or DJ Zimdog. What, what would you oh, go for? Um, DJ Zimdog. What would you go for? It would be the Zim Dog. <laughs> it would, yeah. It, yeah, that's what it is. Zim Dog Productions! <laughs> Zimmerman Industries, Inc. MC Mando on the mic. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, well, with that introduction, um, hello everyone and welcome to the stream. Um, this is. Oh, no, I don't fancy it anymore. I'm muting myself, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, you, g you give up. Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm out of here. Uh, no, no. Something along those lines. But um, hello everyone and welcome to the stream. Uh, this is the first episode of Sim Twitch, which is a weekly interview series, tucking into the minds of Forza Motorsport's fastest ever racers, and we'll be exploring their insights within the 2019 Forza Racing Championship Invitational. Just to have a quick recap of what's happened so far, um, after a showdown in week one which had Red Bull Racing Esports and William Esports face off in match two, a lot of anticipation was held by what's considered the God Squad lineup of Red Bull as they took on the top tier competitors in the likes of Sauber Esports and Jota Esports, alongside a long awaited return of Mordor Game Club who appeared in the 2016 Forza RC Chevrolet Cup in China. This week matched together some of the fastest cars in motorsport, low aero Indy cars and high downforce Le Mans prototypes. Today I'm joined by Forza RC competitors Zermatt of Salbury Sports, who is their Forza racing coach and also a multiple time Forza RC finalist. Jota Commando, who is the first esports player for Jota Esports and is also known for getting a number one world ranking throughout the 2019 2019 Le Mans eSports series and finally we have Lage, the three-time Forza RC champion, Formula E champion and also a racer of Red Bull Racing eSports. How are you all doing today boys? Yeah, yeah. that's the introduction John, um, didn't have to big up Lage that much, mind you could have kept his accolades down a little, you know. <laughs> well, I'll remember that for the next time, Sean. I'll make sure to just undermine your position in the scene. <laughs> As if we all don't feel bad enough as it is. <laughs> nah, what are you talking? <laughs> okay, so, just, so, just so we're all here weekend. for a reason, and that's um, basically to reflect on what happened last weekend. Um, there was a lot of action that was caught both on the broadcast cameras as well as off of it. So if you don't mind, guys, we'll just tuck right into it. So for... Match three in week two, we started off with Maple Valley for race one. And from the get-go in lap one, um, there was an incident, well, there were multiple, but there was one key incident that was caught on camera, which was whereby after about turn two or three, there was an incident between Lage and Bokit. Uh, Lage, we were just hoping if we could tap into your mind for a moment so you could recap on exactly what happened there and also what ran through your mind knowing that you may then get a stop and go penalty uh, so early on in the race. Oh, 
I'm sorry, ladies. Do, do, do you mind if I just stop you for a moment? Because I think um, through the Twitch chat, your audio isn't actually coming up that high. I think we may need to risk you just putting your audio back up, even if it brings some echo. Do you mind? Hello. 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 Yeah. If you just um, if you just start off um again and explain what you happened there, because obviously not everyone was aware of this whole stop and go penalty system that is being brought on. Um. So it'll be interesting to hear what you have to say about it, considering that you was like the first person put under the firing line. Oh, that's that's quite interesting actually, because um, especially with like how fast these cars are going around the track, um, it's I think from a viewer's perspective, it's quite easy to suspect that someone's just being careless with the driving. But obviously, with these cars, they're being built, but they're not being tuned, so there's still that sense of the car's not quite being reliable. So it kind of makes sense the fact that um, it was just like one input that meant like you weren't being able to stick on the inside line that you had going through the turn. But as far as I can tell, Bokit took it in good spirits. Um, so now it, for some reason, there are some people that are still mentioning that some of your voice is not coming through. Uh, do you mind just checking in the party chat to see if your box is ticked to include audio? Yeah, it's ticked. So is it uh, better now or...? It is ticked, that's interesting. Okay. Because there are a few people saying that they can't hear your audio, but I'm hoping that's not a case for everyone who's listening. So, worst case scenario, I'll just have to paraphrase you to the best of my ability. <laughs> um, but, um, one thing that stood in my mind is obviously there's been scepticism about the Forza race regulations as it is, and then coming into match three, you had to deal with the stop and go. Um, there yeah. was some insight into that from the likes of uh, Mechberg and Flip Mode, but can you just tell us like, what was going through your mind thinking that, wow, it's lap one, I'm maybe getting a penalty already, what the hell am I going to do if I need to actually serve this stop and go? In my mind, I was like, uh, after the incident, I was like, okay, I'm going to have a penalty straight away, but I, I, I mean, I didn't. I didn't know I was going to have a stop and go penalty. And uh, <laughs> to be honest, I didn't learn the stop and go zones, so I didn't know where to stop and uh, and uh, yeah, how to do that. So I needed to uh, to ask uh, our coach Azix to uh, to have a look into uh, the rule book and uh, yeah, to explain me exactly what I have to do. So that's why it took uh, it took me so so much. I mean, so much time to to do it. But uh, at the end of the day, it wasn't too uh, too bad. I mean, I went from uh, second to fourth, so it was. Actually, my uh, <laughs> yeah, as, far, 
that, that's the thing like a bit that when you had to stop then three seconds felt like a lifetime but it seemed like you tried to play it out by staying on the track as long as possible chasing davy skills was that your intention to hopefully like build as much gap as you could and then when you served the penalty you're hoping that ideally no one would overtake you but like, as few i mean people as possible. i took Actually, no, it wasn't. I didn't have that in mind. I just wanted to know where I have to uh, to do the penalty. I mean, at the first time, I've been told that uh, my penalty would be a five seconds. I did uh, at the uh, at the end of the race on my rest time. Uh, but they changed it twice. It was uh, the first time. It was five seconds penalty at the end of the race. Then it was five seconds stop and go, and then ten seconds stop and go. So, uh, I mean, I needed to to uh, I mean, yeah, to to wait until I have the final decision from the stewards. And uh, yeah, to have uh, all the information about where to go, the where to do the the stop and go penalty, and uh, and uh, yeah, how much time I needed to 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 wait. So it wasn't okay. my intention well, well, to to wait so long. <laughs> well, well, thanks for giving that insight. Anyway, because um, I think like in the midst of things when obviously you're, you're trying to race and even if you don't have a car literally by your side or behind you you're still having to put all your concentration into just putting in the fastest laps that you can so it's interesting to hear yeah. what your take was on that um we'll, we'll move over to zermatt now because zermatt you've always been in a position where you've actually been competing at the top level um like you've pretty much made it as a finalist in every forza rc but this time you're now having to take that kind of galactic overlord position where you're looking down on your teammates and trying to like help them like navigate amidst all the troubles that are going on how did you find it like for the first time having to like take a take a back seat in that sense and watch your other teammates um take the cars yeah i, I think there's two two things here um you know firstly having the the, the sort of uh confidence i guess a say to to stop driving because it, it almost feels like you're sort of wasting a talent although you know i may not be the best driver i'm, I'm not rubbish um you know I you, 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 stop, you, feel like wasting, <laughs> you feel like you're wasting whatever talent you've been been given and actually it's quite difficult to step away from from the track and it, it kind of you know when racing drivers retire they, they feel like they're sort of losing that um the thing that they're driving for um, I didn't really have that with this team competition though, which is which is great. And and obviously because of the team we have, like I'm I'm obviously really good friends with Dave and Alex. I've known them for a long time, uh, and we've got Felipe in, in with us as well, and he's incredibly fast. So actually, I feel like I'm almost passing the mantle down, and it's it's kind of time for that to happen. So um, you know, to start with, I found it quite difficult, but as um, as the weeks are going on and we're working better and better as a team together, I can. You know, add value in different ways through sort of building the cars and and being able to test the cars with guys. It's not just like a separate coach you can't drive and then the team. So I'm not just telling them what to do. We can work together on it. So from that side of things, it's it's quite rewarding actually. And um, obviously, I've got a bit less sort of pressure on me to perform on the on the track. So that's that's nice for the time being anyway. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the sense of like team chemistry that you have, especially with um, Dave and Chemical. Like you guys just go back in excess of ten years. Like it's, it's crazy to think of it that way, and you're very familiar with like the team racing aspect. Whereas I think a lot of top guys, even though they've been a part of teams per se, they haven't always actually been um, like collaborating on track. Like say like the the situation with Red Bull is quite interesting because obviously, Lage, you you're with Box and you're also now with Venom. Now with Box you've shared like a team per se with like esports and cars in the past but you're still ultimately driving as on like an individual championship so it's like the philosophy of like how do you actually like change that into this championship seems like very interesting to a lot of viewers but i'd like to tap into that um later on um what i wanted to quickly ask you sir Matt, was a bit like what lay had in that one where um, he was just having an issue with like controlling the car on the inside line. We noticed very early on that Chemical had some type of issue, and like there was only like a second glance of his car. But what it looked like is if he was sim twitching whilst going over a crest or some sorts. Is there any chance you can tell us like what exactly happened for him that led to him crashing? 
Yeah, I mean, that was exactly it. Going around the last sector at Maple in that 919, you had to get it sort of exactly perfect. I, I did a lot of practice with Kem going through that section, and it is, it is pretty mental. And actually, in the other cars, you can get away with going on the grass on each of those sort of S's. The 919, for some reason, it just, it just bites more than the other cars. And if you get it slightly wrong, then you, you, you pay the price for it, unfortunately. And that's 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 what happened. Um, a little bit of a, a mistake, but, you know, we don't let us get it down. We, we had a couple of sort of unfortunate incidents in, in that first race, especially. Um, and But it was great that Dave could be uh, out front and sort of keep Lage at bay. I guess sort of Lage knew he had a penalty, yeah. but, it, it you know, Dave showed some really great pace. At the top, uh, the guys were absolutely flying up there. So, um, yeah, we had some incidents. Um, you know, unfortunate that Alex made a, a little bit of a mistake. But, yeah, we, we move and we learn, on, uh, learn from it. And, you know, we don't let, let it bother us, all that sort of thing. And, you know, we carry on. So, uh, I think actually, like I say, with the team cohesion thing, as soon as that happened, and we knew that sort of Zoom and, and, and Chemical were in a position where they weren't going to score that many points, we were all on the mic, you know, getting behind Dave and you know, giving all the support that we can as a team. So uh, I think we, we don't have any issues around sort of ego or, or big personalities. You know, it's it's a really, really good team unit. And I think that that's that's going to be really powerful for us this, this season. That's fantastic to hear. Thanks for sharing that. Um, now, Commando, um, you've been a player with Jota for pretty much the entirety of 2019. And although you've bared the name with pretty damn good success, like especially in the Le Mans qualifiers, um, you've had to wait a long time before actually seeing like a team realised and forged around you. So going into this championship, like, what were your expectations going into this match against the likes of Sauber and Red Bull? And um, how, how did you think the first race went looking back? Well, uh, as for expectations um, with the team, I think it wasn't it wasn't too it wasn't too bad for me. I was, with the Jota, the situation, I was able to pick the drivers I wanted, um, pick the team I wanted, then pick the coach, pick the two other drivers alongside me. Um, so you picked Kraft. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> well, I think I think it's better, better as a coach than he does as a driver. No offence to him, but um, I think his coach role probably is the best role for him. Plays to his strengths. <laughs> yeah, plays to his strengths. Uh, obviously, with South, South, South's my man. South's fast, um, good friend as well. Get on well with him. And then Bouquet, fellow Welshman. I'm not the only lone sheep in the RC anymore. Uh, plus, he's come from come from being a good driver to a great driver to a top driver, and that progression is only going to get better, you know. So, I mean, when it comes to picking the drivers and having your team, then you know it was pretty obvious for me who I was going to get, and uh, yeah, it's worked out well. As ex expectations going into round one were pretty high, um, I thought we could take it to Red Bull. Um, you know, I knew Bill Kett was really quick around Maple Valley, and I think he finished with the quickest lap time as well. It was, it was like a 1 minute 8.8 .8 or something, and I knew he was doing like two, three tenths quicker than I'm practice, which I thought was impressive. Um, South was really quick in the 919. I think he, he was the, I think he was the best finishing um, 919 in the race. And then me and the prototype, the Peugeot 905. Uh, I knew I was strong in that car. Um, I I had confidence that if Lage was in there or Venom or Box, that I could uh, put up a good battle. But unfortunately, I had the three-second penalty. I took Box on track, but the three-second penalty demoted me back down to third. And the incident with um, Bouquet and Lage was unfortunate. But then going into Silverstone, I thought, you know, it's still all to play for, really. And was the penalty that you served, was that the same as Lage of having to do a stop and go? Or was that no. just like automatically applied from the Forza Race regulations? Yeah, from the FRR, yeah. Um, Maple Valley was quite savage with the penalties on the last sector where where Chemical crashed. Um, if you, like, and, you could and make basically a mistake. basically if you lose one second, you'll, you have a three seconds penalty. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. 
It was it was way too much of a penalty, and it affected the racing in a way. The the FRR system, as we know, isn't great in the FRC, and uh, I think it affected the racing at a whole really like I think Chemical probably wouldn't have sim twitched if um he didn't have to worry so much about getting a three or three and a half second penalty as well. Like it's a bit of a more of a reaction, a bit of a more of a nervous racing technique when you have to think about uh, if I go a millimetre over a curb or the line but you know I'm gonna get penalised with three seconds. And when you're in high speed cars doing, you know, one hundred and sixty mile an hour through a chicane, then uh Trying to keep it clean every lap is pretty difficult. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. Like, as, as as responsive as the cars are, because you're going so damn fast, it's like there's only so much that you can actually respond to, or like tweak yeah. your line, you know. And, that's it. Yeah. So, and, and, and that, when you're in draft, that's something that well, I wanted to open worse, up. It adds, it, you know, it adds to the yeah. difficulty of it because when you're in a draft of a car in front or behind, you know, it, it unsettles your car as well. So you could make a mistake, lose time, but. Primarily, you you get a three second penalty, but you've lost four seconds, you know. So, and how how I want to open this up to all three of you. Um, this mix of having the Forza regulations as well as this stop and go format. Um, what are your thoughts on it? Do you think it's something that should be carried forward? And if so, are you happy with it, or does it just need refining? I think it needs refining. I think it's good that they've done it. I think it's a great idea and I think it, it helps in the competition of where they can get um, quick decisions made in the steward processes done quickly without having to, without having to look at people cutting the track. You know, like that's done for, you know, the game does that for them. Whereas then incidents are obviously like with Lays then they, they can look at that and then look at that as a penalised penalty. But the penalties are way too harsh. Um, for a uh, championship setting. I mean, especially on Maple Valley. I mean, on the other tracks, it's, uh, it was actually fine, I think. But Maple Valley was just too much. Like three seconds yeah. when you're already losing one second, you just, uh, I mean, it's not realistic. And uh, so, yeah. yeah. But, uh, I agree. Well, even, even in the instance of, you know, like if you're going through Maple Valley and say, like, you know, you're literally taking the last turn and you're going onto the home straight and, like, you're ever so slightly on the edge. If you do happen to just cross your fourth wheel over that white line, like, the penalty can be as big as, like, half a second or a second when we all know that the difference could be, like, a tenth max compared to if you ran uh, that clean. I mean, in so, this case, when you were outside uh, on the last corner, you were actually losing time, but uh, still one second yeah. penalty. Yeah. 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 I actually think that, that FR, but we shouldn't be able to see, drivers shouldn't be able to see what penalty they've got because you find yourself in a situation where the driver in front of the driver got three seconds penalty and you just are like, oh, okay, I'll just stay within three seconds now. It kind of ruins the racing a little bit. Yeah, but if I you agree. didn't know yeah. that, you'd still be trying to pass them and you'd, you'd, be, you know, you'd be flat out. And actually, I think it ruins the on track racing a little bit. That's a yeah, really yeah. interesting aspect. Do, do, do you think it would be ideal then if um, Turn 10 were able to make it so that there are the Forza Race regulations, but during the race, like maybe there's a feature that say like in your HUD display, like it's not something that can bother drivers. Like drivers should just be left to do their business, and then at the end, um, the adjudication team can just look at whatever things were flagged up. I, I think so. Um, uh, it would play absolute yeah. turmoil with the drivers as well. Like the psychological strain would be brilliant. And, uh, and you know, what, what I want to say is now I'm not driving is, you know, guys like Commander and Lage being pushed to the absolute limit, you know, psychologically and mentally. You've got to reach the complete capacity while they're racing. Have I got a penalty? Or do I not have a penalty? How do I race this? I need to get past this guy. You know, I need to do this. You know, I think if if they can sort of see the whole situation, then there's not that strain, there's not that stress. So I think, um, yeah, you know, I think it'd be better if we didn't see. I don't know what you guys think. I mean, to be honest, it was uh, yeah, like agree. that last year, like without any uh, adjudication during the race. And uh, I mean, we we've been waiting for so long between races. I mean, uh, I remember during the final in London. Like between each race, we needed to wait for one hour, which which was a uh, monthly quite hard. Mm, I have true. to admit. So I, mean, well, I still, still like... have the adjudication during the race. You just don't you just don't know about it, and you just get a pop up saying, "Oh, you've got a five second penalty now," you, or you, you know that sort of thing. So you just can't see the yeah. tally of the FRR. You can't see yeah, but I mean, it's... penalties applied. 
Yeah, but I mean, it's 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 uh, cool at least to have uh, the penalty of everybody during the race and to have your own penalty, what to expect during the race as well, so you can adapt. Yeah, I said yeah. Well, so so th this opens up an interesting aspect there because I um, mean, you were talking about how you know like it would be ideal if drivers could actually just receive like a more definite like prop up or notification about where they actually stand penalty I mean, wise as opposed I mean, the to you're getting should... notifications and you don't even yeah. know if it will stick or not at the end. No, I mean the driver should get a notification of their penalty, but the rest of the field shouldn't get a notification of your penalty. So, for instance, now like if on Maple Valley, if I if I went over the crest of the hill, cut the chicane, and I got a three-second penalty, Laser wouldn't have, Laser or Box wouldn't have known that I had a three-second penalty, but I would have, mm. you know. So yeah. they could have thought, well, I'll play this easy now. I I'll let him take over me. Then I'll just hang off. I'll hang behind him for three seconds, you know, rather than battling him. Lose, you know. You, you take different risks. You, you you change your strategy. You change your mentality. Um, I, I don't think it's for the, the for the better because, like you said, if, like for instance, now if I was in front of Laser or if Laser was in front of me and he had a three-second penalty, for instance, and I knew he had a three-second penalty, then I'm not going to go and I'm not going to race him. I'm not going to go and try and overtake him. It's pointless because I'm going to win the race anyway. So I think it takes away from the show. I think it takes away from the aspect of racing. Yeah. Well, something that agree. that's been leaving me to think of, if you don't mind, um, is a lot of people have actually been wondering how the races are actually working. So, you know, in the past, when every Forza RC, it was just kind of every man for themselves. Obviously, all of you racers would be in the same party chat. How has that changed now that there is the coaching aspect? Um, are all teams kind of split up in their own party chats and then it's down to the coach? So say, in this case, Sir Matt, would you be receiving notifications from an adjudicator or something like that? How does it work? Yeah, so we've actually got quite a cool setup where we can see all of the drivers' feeds. Uh, and we can also have a, lot, we have a live feed from the adjudicator saying who has what penalty. So as soon as Lager's penalty, I can see that on my screen as, as well and obviously I can relay that to the guys um, but it's quite interesting because I can sort of see the whole the whole race so it's it's quite a cool setup really it's gonna be it's gonna be wicked when we go to five arenas as well um, it's gonna be um, really important because those communication those tactics before and during the race are, are really yeah, yeah, really yeah. important yeah, actually it's not so it's yeah. there's no possibility of that in the past was there again. Yeah. yeah, it's like on Silverstone, whereas um, I was, I think I was in second, Lage was long gone, Lage was like a thousand foot in front, he was nowhere to be caught. <laughs> um, I was in second and Boquette was behind me and we had, I think, Box was in fourth, but we had a good buffer to Box um, and the coach's role in that time was critical uh, because Krav told me to let Boquette go um, to gain the next position, and we would have got a boost the next round. You know, th them little th them little details are going to make a massive difference in gaining that extra bit of points in the next race um, for for the championship for you know the life finals. So that aspect of the coach, I think, is great, and I think it gives the coach, you know, um, an important job in a sense where people might not see it, but in that situation, it was very important. You know, because I wouldn't have thought of it. Boquette wouldn't have thought of it because we didn't know, we didn't know the next best person's positions gains, you know. So mm, yeah, that's interesting because it, well, you it was cool on um, the broadcast there, Boquette going through the last few turns and then out of nowhere you're slowing down and loads of people in like the mixer and Twitch chats were like, oh, what the hell is going on? And but yeah. it, it, I think people because this is so new, this whole element of using boosts, um, I think it's, it, it might take another week or two for people to really appreciate like all the strategies that are going on into it. Um, but you made yeah. a really good segue yeah. about um, Silverstone, Commando, because um, something that like stuck out very strongly for me, even more so than the collision that happened in uh, Race 1 at Maple Valley, was the... Race two featured what appeared to be like a growing theme of the match with players from Mordor Gaming Club. Like they they were showing pace that was actually quite respectable, I think, amidst some of the other teams that are in yep. the competition. But their pace did seem, unfortunately, to be like heavily overshadowed by collisions that they made with other drivers. So, for instance, lap one, 
I think um, it was by turn one someone had got punted off not to say that that was from MGC because um, it wasn't caught on camera but going into turn three um, I distinctly remember on camera it showed I believe um, chemical like was rammed which then pushed him into zoom which then pushed him into south and I think all three of them spun out and um, so in south's instance his car was damaged and he had to just hobble it the entire way um, for yeah. like the rest of the race but, c but can you guys touch in at all what happened at Silverstone there because there were so many cars caught in that carnage in just a few moments that no, yeah. none of I the don't viewers think were able to catch Chemical it. wasn't involved, I think there was um, one of the Modo Gaming Club drivers, I think it was Meow 226 I think, uh, I think he just missed his breaking point going into turn 3 and obviously you're coming into turn 3 you're so quick in an Indy car and the prototypes and stuff, like you miss your breaking point by you know a couple of meters it's going to make a big difference on the impact of the car in front because the car in front of that is breaking early the car in front of that one's breaking early so it's just a chain reaction and i think he hit zoom and then zoom it um south and then south got down i think zoom got spun around backwards i think after the exit of turn three as well and then he got hit again by the same driver so i think it was just, um you know that one one mistake of um, the uh, Mordor driver, you know, missing his breaking point, then just caused the train reaction. Really, just a racing incident. To be fair, yeah, there was certainly nothing that looked malicious by it. And and, and the thing is, we I want to be very careful about like any criticism that I invite about MGC because obviously they're, they're not here on the show with us because unfortunately it's just not possible the guys are a team that are based in china and um i wasn't able to find anyone who would be able to actually like conduct the interview so it's always worth giving them the benefit of the doubt but um i, I was still surprised that there were no penalties carried out for it for that considering the yeah. amount of damage it's done to other players um how did how did each of your teams feel about that well, I think there was a, uh, I think there was a penalty, but it was a um, sort of five second stop and go. I think by that time, I think he was in tenth or eleventh anyway, so it didn't actually make a difference to um, anyone's race really. Uh, just made his slightly, slightly worse. So, which is the frustrating thing with that sort of penalty system. There's not really any way around it, but um, I think there was a small penalty. It just didn't really make that much difference. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can't, I, I know, you can't really undo a, what's no. been done, can you? So, like, it was the same yeah. with Legion Box, uh, Legion Boquette. It was unfortunate. You know, Box, um, sorry, Lage went from second to fourth, didn't really lose a great amount because his next team had finished third or second. But then Boquette, uh, you know, went from last to eighth. You know, you can only punish people for a mistake. You can't really change the outcome of. Uh, the, the the unfortunate drivers, you know, you can't say, oh well, he's been taken out. Let's put him back up into third position, and you know, it's just racing. You know, it's going to happen. I like, guess, you know, it's it's not going to be the first time stuff like that's going to happen through the competition. Yeah, either. especially on Metal Valley. Yeah, especially yeah. on Metal Valley. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, you've seen in, in, uh, in you, uh, were, you were right actually. Uh, oh, go on, sorry, John. Um, yeah, all I was going to say is um, you, you were right in correcting me about um, Chemical wasn't involved in that incident because um, he was actually, I believe he was chasing you throughout the duration of lap one, isn't that correct? But, yeah, I mean, that's right. Yeah. Coming he into the last sector, there, there was some type yeah. of issue, I think, like he outbroke himself and then he tapped yeah, you yeah, and for yeah, some reason yeah. it was actually him who spun, spun in, out yeah. instead of you, which was yeah. baffling. But I think it's because that car is um, so light, that 919 is so light, uh, yeah. any contact, it just spins it around. It's, even though it's a four-wheel drive car and it's so understeery it's quite a light and uh, twitchy car to handle like when it comes to contact and losing control of it is, is that porsche um another mid-engined yeah yeah oh well, that just explains it all doesn't it everyone has this thing like the, the mystery of the mid-engine cars why, why do they feel so light no matter <laughs> how heavy they yeah. actually are yeah. um so c considering the fact that you know you three teams right here, you're all very familiar with each other, regardless of whether you've been teammates or not, because you've all been competing for so many years. Um, did you guys actually have any reservations about a team that's considered a true outsider and they're completely unknown? Like, um, what? Did, were you, any of you willing to reveal like 
a tactic or reservation you had going into um, like any of the matches, knowing that MGC they could just be f throwing dive bombs everywhere or crashing? Like, did that really affect the way you wanted to race? I think uh, it didn't affect our sort of preparation with sort of car builds or anything like that. But you, you certainly have to give someone who you've never raced before a bit of a wide berth. You know, you, you don't know how they're going to act yeah. in any situations. You know, I've raced with Lage and Commando so much over the last few years that, um, well, maybe not Lage so much winning, but um, <laughs> yeah, I know <laughs> it's very. That's about the most backhanded compliment I've ever heard. <laughs> Um, I know pretty much what everyone's going to do in, in every situation and, and everyone does for the sort of main set of guys who, who go to the lands and, and the line. So to have someone completely unknown or, or a team of three people completely unknown come in and sort of not throw their weight around but definitely get stuck in and, and sort of cause a bit of a stir, then you've got, you've got to say actually, well I certainly said it was in the second race, you know, take take a bit of a you know cautious line with these guys because we've seen sort of what's happened so far and, and obviously that didn't quite work out but but now we know um and it is going to be the same with you know other teams uh, if smp was still in the competition like uh, it, it would be the same with them so um it's just the unknown that you've got to be aware of yeah yeah and with us with, with this smp uh racing um obviously we, we've <sighs> You know, th there was enough upset over the fact that they weren't there because when it came to match four, a lot of people believed that the other teams were not given three points, but definitely given a cushion, um, considering the fact that even if you finish last in that race, you're still guaranteed points. Um, how did all of you feel about that, knowing that you've, you've worked so hard through match, th match three, and regardless of like the points you've drawn together, there are teams racing just after you that are actually getting a bit of a free pass when it comes to some points. Yeah, well, it, it's just one of them things, you know, you can't blame the teams competing. It was, you know, SMP that dropped out. It's unfortunate for us all, and, you know, the rest of the teams are obviously not going to be happy. You know, it's, it, you know, you, you think where S um, AMS, if they finish last every race, they were still guaranteed 36 points. You know, when you look at things like that, it's like, oh, you know, it's it's not great. It's not great for the competition in the whole. Um, having that one less team like Matt just, you know, Matt just covered then. You know, even having a, a team like MGC or SMP, for instance, uh, you might not, you might not go into the competition thinking they're going to be able to beat you, and you might not be, you know, worrying about their pace and all. But having that extra team there makes a big difference in the race situation. You know. Um, F from the instance of turn one, it definitely does. Two, it's an extra you know. three cars that you have to yeah, pull and maneuver around. Yeah, it does make a difference. But like, we can't, like, we can't blame any of the teams competing for it. It was just, a, it was just an unfortunate situation that SAP didn't turn up, and it was too yeah. late for the organisers to uh, do anything about it. Really. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sam. Were you about to say something there? I, I could it's feel your breath just about croaking say, in. Uh, you know, I, I, I would have liked to, you know, have seen a because uh, everything's been quite last minute since that's happened sort of behind the scenes I probably can't say too much but I would have liked to see the guys the competition organisers have a bit of a plan B because you know it yeah. is an invitational yeah. and some people decline invites so um, you know it would have been great if they had a, a plan A and a plan B and we could have switched straight to plan B and everyone was aware of it but yeah. um, you know that wasn't the case yeah, I suppose like people yes. like, who aren't even competing, they, they they dream that oh, ideally there would have been like a reserve team that could have filled in that spot. But to be yeah. honest, like it, I think it, even from my perspective, that's actually a bit of a logistical nightmare just for the producers of the event because you know you're ex you're then expecting people to put so much preparation in and they don't even know whether they're going to race or not. So I suppose yeah, it like is what it we, is. Uh, we came up with um, a solution before the race that was to put our team Jota into the next match. Um, you know, even if we didn't Convenient. score any points, just to be there, you know, just to be like in the match. <laughs> um, you know, just to, stop, uh, just to have like a <laughs> team race, race, you know. Well, obviously that didn't, that wasn't going to happen, but um, yeah, you know, it's just a force of these situations, you know. I think I think this would have been solved with not having an invitation actually and having uh, having yeah. everyone to qualify 
then get into the invitational sort of section and then you could very much have a reserve team and actually <laughs> if I was that reserve team I'd, I'd be pretty up for that um, yeah. you know there's a chance yeah. that you can be involved and there's a chance you will be going to the LAN if you yeah. you know if someone drops out or if someone's terrible you know there's so many different things that could have been considered like a bit of a league system you know whatever it may be I think it's a it's an interesting talking point actually and a lot of teams I think would be clambering for that reserve place yeah, agree. yeah, well, oh, geez, N now you're just like opening the door in my mind there because now I'm starting to hypothesize about, oh my god, how could we actually do like a drafted series where like players are competing? Because when you look back at the 2018 Forza RC, you know, when you had pretty much the qualifying rounds each week where people would be doing ghosted racing, it's like, well, I suppose you could apply that for team members as well. It's just they have to be signed up on the website and it's these people, and then you tally the points together the same way, and then you get to a point which is a bit like what we have now this round robin um fiesta of um cars actually battling against each other um but for now you know it's another invitational and although some people aren't happy with it like i'm just glad to actually see a team racing championship put in play um you know Zeme, like you've you've never held your breath back about it you've always wanted it as well and like for me it's just like I know I've known team racing could exist since Project Gotham Racing. It's like it's about time to see that it's being done on a massive like multinational game such as Forza. So all in all, we're each of you guys actually happy with how race two at Silverstone went. Obviously you would have wished that there wasn't a collision here or there, but overall did it match your expectations? <clears throat> if no one's answering, right. I'm going to put it on late. Yeah. I'm putting it on late. You answer yeah, first. Yeah, yeah, I can answer that question. I mean, I, I'm actually happy about uh, how, it's, um, how it goes. Like, I actually like the format, um, the PI budget and different cars and uh, stuff like that. The only thing I really don't like is about the boost thing. I mean, to me, it's pretty useless to have that because people are just, uh, I mean, doing their strategies based on, uh, on the, having the boost. And then when you have the boost, it's just too OP. Like you gain one, more than one second sometimes. I mean, on the, yeah. um, not yeah, uh, for the agree. last round with the Indy cars and uh, and those cars, it wasn't uh, it wasn't a big deal. But uh, except on Maple Valley, but I mean for the previous round, it was just too much. I mean, you have like 80 horsepower more. I mean, just gives an, an extra one and a half second, which uh, I mean it kills the racing basically. Yeah, it yeah. should be like a quarter of a second or, or max, absolute max half a second. Like uh, and it should be like a combination of maybe slightly more power or in the terms like it, at the minute it's like they said it's just ridiculous and and the, you know this week looking forward to this week where it tracks like Hockenheim and Suzuka where you've got a couple of sections which power is massively useful and a couple of the boost mm -hmm. upgrades for some of the cars are like. 100 plus horsepower so it's uh, plus they've, and that's it's, like a night and a day bit, difference in, in yeah, this type of plus, competition isn't it yeah plus so coming into these final weeks remaining they've um added extra boost upgrades so a team can a team can score up to five boost upgrades in one race you can, if you get a clean sheet no penalties you get two upgrades um if you get a hard charge you get one upgrade so basically if you do everything right the next race, you can have, you can have an upgrade boost on every single one of your cars. Um, so, uh, and, and, so, so that's the thing. Like you say, when you do it right, and and I think this is what a lot of people are like concerned about. Um, like obviously doing the right thing to get the boost. Do you feel that's actually in spirit with what each of you have hoped what team racing would be about? Um, no, because it seems no. like in some situations no, no, no. it's really not about which team can get their guys across no. the you line can finish, first. It's you can about... finish 12th, 11th and 10th, get two boost upgrades and then win the next race. Um, it's just not... It's just like the old system of last year, the reverse grid system, which was, in, it was entertaining to watch. But at the same time, you could finish last and then... Um, you'd have a chance to win the next race, but then it gives the, it, it sort of gives then the people who actually win the race um, a bit of a handicap, which in my sense you shouldn't be you shouldn't be handicapped for doing a good result. You know, if you if you win, you win. You should be able to uh, you know win the next race as well. You should be able to keep up your momentum. Whereas you could come, t you know, twelfth, eleventh, and tenth, get a boost upgrade, go a second, a lap quicker than the rest of the field. 
you know, so th this, there's going to be strategy played out where people are going to give up a, a fourth position to finish fifth, to finish fifth, sixth, seventh. Uh, you know, it takes away from the race and it, you know, yeah, it's more strategic play, but I, I don't agree with it. I, I don't think it's, um, you know, I don't think uh, it's not something, uh, you know, a high-end competition for a lot of effort and a lot of money up for grabs that you should be able to, you know, end your championship on somebody having a boost upgrade then, you know. I mean, for, so, for example, uh, I mean, for example, regarding... Go ahead, like, um, sorry. Yeah, I mean, um, on the previous weekend, I mean, we uh, finished like second, third and fourth. So we scored a whole lot of points already and we had a boost for the next race. So, I mean, just, um, I mean, just wouldn't happen to me. I mean, just too much. Yeah. I mean, I, I yeah. would agree if the boost would be a result for the, the, the last team. I mean, uh, after the first race, the last team gets one boost. Why not? But I mean, this way, just like, I mean, it's not racing to me. No. Yeah, like, I, I think it, it's something that it doesn't matter whether it's a racing game, fighting game, shooting games. Like, whenever there's an element where someone can be rewarded for effectively sandbagging, um, I think that's yeah. something that's probably yeah. being the sour touch. But like, to to give turn turn credit i i am actually a big fan of this um performance the index build. system yeah that's great i that's think amazing. that's fantastic that's that's the best thing I, they've ever done on added to a competition by far the pi the pi that you get like 20 pi to you know you could put it on one car you can uh, spread it between three cars two cars that's great that changes the strategies that adds to the racing you know that's a team effort but the boosts ruin now then if you ask me now even more so because there's, there's even more boosts added um, I don't yeah. in, a, in like Mercedes a cheesy really. way I, I, yeah in a cheesy way i think it actually reflects motorsport much more than just having all the cars yeah. exactly the same because whatever series you look at whether it's formula one um, World Rally Championship, or um, say like Le Mans series, um, like WEC. Sorry, um, the winning teams aren't necessarily the person who is literally just the fastest raw pace person. It's actually the assortment of all the knowledge and techniques that the guys apply yeah. to make the yeah, most yeah. of the resources they have. So yeah, <laughs> I think in that respect, it's it's a great step forward. It's um, like Krav came over maybe the, the boost over element the is just holding it back. Yeah, and it was like, Crab came over the town on Silverstone, and he was like, Sean, it's James, uh, leave Bokehead past this lap. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I mean, you, you talk about, like, F1, like, for me, the boost is kind of like Formula E, where they've started a new series, and they're clambering for mm. some excitement, because that's something new. Racing, isn't that great yeah. with Formula E. So, you know, yeah. in Formula E, they've got the, the boost upgrade, like, power upgrade through, uh, basically, popularity vote each week and this is kind of similar to that i think it's the yeah. championship's way of trying to make it artificially interesting yeah but, no, but I, I think mean, compared to formula think, it's like i mean in, in formula e they have the boost for five seconds not a whole race yeah yeah, yeah exactly not a whole race yeah. I want, exactly. But, but i think what they've done they made it interesting with the pi the builds that they've made on the pi budget that was interesting enough, if you ask me. That was enough. There was like there was no need for a yeah. boost upgrade, and and if you did exactly, get a boost yeah, upgrade, it would have to be very difficult to gain, like you know. And I think they've made it too easy, like a hard charger. You know, you you could have lanes now. Um, you know, start in the fastest car, put him in fifth, take the win, um, or like any but you know any other drivers. Uh, you know, but the thing is, he could have a boost on his car. Put him last, knows that nobody else has got a boost, then get a boost for the next race. Like, it's just, yeah, it's, it's not great. It's not the best. Yeah. Well, I think we can all agree that, that um, you know, as far as the competition's set up, for the most part, it's actually a really big step forward for a team aspect. And I, personally, I would love to see the build performance index allotment to carry forward, maybe scrap. Um, the bonuses and handicaps that come along with it because that does seem to kind of get in, in the way of what everyone wants to do here which is drive as fast as possible but um, I don't want us to run out of time without touching on race 3 at Road America and um, so the broadcast failed to catch it in time but what I 
um, understand was that there was actually like a bottleneck in of the cars on the main straight. Obviously, you've got the likes of the Porsche um, charging off with extreme acceleration, but then it's got the problem of trying to squeeze through cars. And it looked as if there were quite a few cars that ended up being pushed onto the grass or into the walls. Um, I know South was one of the people who was like pinned into the wall, but um, do, do you guys remember any other people like um, losing positions right off the bat just by trying to get to turn one? Yeah, well, South was pinned on me. Um, he called. <laughs> he called that he was going up on the inside too late. So I was side by side with Box. Box squeezed me to the right, so I like moved right more as South was coming through. So that's where a bit of a, you know, a bit of we learn next time a bit of better team communication would come through. Um, that, that was that was our fault for not communicating to you, to be honest with you, the South incident. The rest of it, I didn't really pay much attention. I was too busy, uh, too busy racing um, and seeing what was going on in front of me. How about you, Zerm? How did you find the start going into Road America? Like, did it actually play out um, as you hoped for? Um, I, I think the technical term for it is a clusterfuck. Um, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it, it's very well, considerate, may I add. So, you're not uh, wrong, yeah. uh, <laughs> I think it's just when you when you've got cars that are, and we're going to see it this week as well uh, that can launch in three different ways and three different speeds. It's going to be just chaos to start with and. It kind of ruins it in a way, but it adds some excitement. Again, it's almost almost really exciting that actually it's just a nightmare. Just that first uh, like hundred, hundred fifty meters, it's going to be pure luck. Who gets through it? Almost like there, there is going to be no one on the grid. I don't care how canny you are, or how experienced you are, who always gets through that situation safely. It's just not going to happen. So it, it you know. I guess it's it's kind of good in the way that it, it mixes it up, but but it always causes mayhem on the first order. And when we're talking about hundreds of thousands of pounds on the line, I'm not sure I want to want to see too much artificial situations. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, precisely. And, and with that instance, um, it was obvious, to, like South in particular, that like he was just driving like a madman, like with pure fury as well. Like, um, you know, he was he was covered by all of MGC, and then for the, like the first two laps, he was literally battling with them, getting past, and he'd done a good job of that actually, and started like claiming some points back, which is a massive improvement considering what happened at Silverstone. But like you mentioned, Zermatt, like it's just. It, it, it really matters a lot when you have these certain types of car combinations that you have that like I suppose the car track combo matters even more now compared to in the past Forza RCs. Um, I, I know that you I know that uh, you need to head off now soon Zermatt and I think we've actually come to like a natural like close to it so I'm gonna do a quick fire round if you guys don't mind it's just gonna be a few questions they're gonna be fast questions and fast answers so I just want you to hit away with whatever answer comes to mind now the fairest way I can do this is in order of championships points so no pressure laid but we'll rotate answers with you then we go to commando and then followed by Zermatt so question one what's your dream car um, Burgundy Yuara. Commando? Uh, Ferrari 458 Italia. <laughs> Zerma. I'll have a 911. Rest, please. 911, okay. Lage, what's the first car you've owned? Uh, Peugeot 206 uh, CC. Commando? Ford Escort. Zerma. I'd have... A 1.25 litre Fiesta called Tango. Oh, that sounds so cute. <laughs> Question three. <laughs> Question three. Name the first world record you ever had on a Forza Motorsport game. Starting with you, Lage. Uh, Forza 3, um, Le Mans. It was with a, with a Nissan in a P-Class. I can't remember the name of the Nissan. Commando. I think it was Silverstone uh, in Forza 4 when I... I took it in an online hopper on accident to get that in. <laughs> so, Matt. Uh, Forza 2, I think it was a C Civic or Celica. Uh, uh, look at it, I'm going to go back to the snake tracks. 
<laughs> you took a, you took a number one before the first uh, combat. <laughs> okay, fourth question. On what Forza game did you first believe that you could actually compete for prizes? Lage. Um, for the, I mean, end of Forza three, I knew I was like I have a good pay. I had a good pace, but Forza four was a game. I mean, I think it was my best one. So I would say Forza four. Okay, Commando. Sim. And Zermat. <laughs> to be honest, with you, pretty much the same. Like you, you always think you're going to be good, and then when actually more and more people start playing the game, and you're still up there. You're like, yeah, I'm, I'm actually alright. Okay, then. So all of you with fours are four. That's interesting. Okay, so the last question is, if you could have a fours racing championship, such as this one whereby everyone has to run the exact same car for the entire series, what car would you choose? Oh, this Late. is easy. Um, well, I mean, if I have to choose any car, like, and everybody rests the same car. Any car you want yeah. that, that everyone else would have to compete with against you in. Uh, the F1? <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, Commando. I mean, I, w I wouldn't be that happy with that, but I would have picked the Mazda 77B. Oh, that's so obvious as well. Yeah, man. Yeah, <laughs> it was a pretty bad question, John. Well. You know, these, these questions are too easy, mate. You're not putting us, you're not putting us enough pressure. Uh, <laughs> <think I'll> <laughs> the okay, and how about you, Zer, mate? For the best racing, I'd have, I'd have to put, pick the stock touring car, the Audi RS3, the one that came out oh. in the year. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty decent car, yeah, not gonna lie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is just a pretty funny answer that we've got here. So, um, thank you all for um, your time here. I really do appreciate it, each of you. Um, I certainly want to have you back on the show in the future. Ideally, we'll be having it with um, web webcam as well, so we can all see your pretty faces as you awkwardly try and rush to answering these questions. Um, and to all the people that, who have watched, uh, really appreciate all the comments you've dropped in the Twitch chat. This video will actually be published on YouTube as well, so do subscribe and tune in for future episodes in the coming weeks of the Forza RC. Um, now, for each of you... Uh, I'd just like you to give out uh, the best way that any fans or followers can get in touch with you, be it on Twitter or any other social media. So, Lage, what's the uh, best way for fans to find you? Uh, well, on Twitter, it's uh, Mal Malé Aurelian. So, that's how to find me. Okay, great. And how about you, Commando? <laughs> I was going to say the same, man, but my Twitter handle is not that. Uh, Twitter, it's certainly uh, not Malé Aurelian. <laughs> Uh, yeah, on Twitter. It's just Lage 2.0, is that, is that what you're hinting at? Under Commando, yeah, I'm going to change my name to Lage 2.0. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Zermat, uh, how can people follow you? Yeah, similar, get me on Twitter, Salvo Zermat. Okay, awesome. Well, uh, thank you everyone for watching. Um, and do subscribe to us on YouTube as well as follow us on Twitch. And uh, we shall... Uh, be back with you next week.